Good morning and good afternoon. Uh, welcome to ARA's webinar Wednesday, and a special welcome to those from the railroad community who may be new to ARA's webinar Wednesday. I am Sri Rao, your moderator for today's webinar titled Research Supporting Safe Transportation of Hazardous Materials by Rail. Uh, this is a very timely topic, and uh, for those who have been participating in Webinar Wednesday for a long time, um, you'll notice this is a little bit of a deviation from some of the topics we've typically covered, but nevertheless, you will find this very this presentation very enlightening. Um, now I'd like to introduce our presenter and my colleague, Dr. Stephen Kirkpatrick. Uh, Dr. Stephen Kirkpatrick is an associate at Applied Research Associates, Inc., and prior to joining ARA in 1999, Dr. Kirkpatrick worked 14 years as a research engineer at SRI International. Over his 37-year career, Dr. Kirkpatrick has performed a wide range of crashworthiness and structural dynamics research. Um, in the rail crashworthiness community, Dr. Kirkpatrick has performed research and design projects with a number of organizations, including the FRA, the FDA, the AAR, uh, rail vehicle manufacturers and railway operators, uh, basically a full list of who's who in the railroad community. Uh, Dr. Kirkpatrick has been the principal investigator in a wide range of programs to improve railroad tank car safety for hazardous material transportation. Uh, and these include efforts to increase the puncture resistance of tank cars and to improve the understanding of train derailment mechanics. And now I'd like to turn the program over to my colleague and friend, uh, Stephen Kirkpatrick. Thank you, Shree. Uh, here's an outline of what I'll be presenting in this webinar. Uh, first, I want to provide a, a brief historical background for railroad safety in general and then hazmat transportation by rail specifically. And then next, I want to describe some of the developments from the major tank car re safety research programs over the past 20 years, approximately. Uh, these include the Next Generation Railroad Tank Car Project, the Advanced Tank Car Collaborative Research Program, and the RSI AAR Railroad Tank Car Safety Research and Test Project. Finally, I want to describe some ongoing efforts in derailment modeling with the objective of trying to tie together the work from these various research programs. As outlined, my objective is to summarize the, the research over approximately the past 20 years for tank car safety. But um, to introduce this topic, I first wanted to give a historical background on railroad safety. And when I look back, one of the themes I found commonly is that many of the advances in railroad safety were driven by high profile accidents. Uh, here's a classic example of that, the great train wreck, train wreck of 1918, this crash cost at least 101 lives and more than 171 people were seriously injured. Um, and this was the most severe collision in US passenger rail history. And it resulted in significant changes for passenger rail operations and as well as equipment. For example, previously, most of the passenger car coaches were made out of wood and, and it transitioned to steel. A lot of that being the, the findings of um, you know, the U.S. mail cars that were made out of steel and much stronger. And so this really kind of transformed passenger rail at that time. When we get into HAZMAT and the timeline for HAZMAT safety research, I traced it back as far as a series of accidents in the 1970s. Um, these accidents then resulted in a significant amount of research and, and regulation. Um, the three accidents that occurred were in Crescent City, uh, Decatur, and Waverly, and they placed pressure on the industry and government to address safety. As a result of that, the RSI AAR Railroad Tank Car Safety Research and Test Project, which is more commonly called the Tank Car Safety Project, was initiated, um, and it's actually still going on today. Uh, from its inception, I would describe the Tank Car Safety Project as a data-driven research program. Um, you know, one of the very first efforts they had there was to collect data from accidents uh, in the time period 1958 to 1970, um, and and then look at those and try and determine uh, what were the safety issues that they're seeing. From that, they could develop mitigation strategies and implement those strategies. 
Safety features that were resulted from this program include double, double shelf couplers, head shields, bottom fittings protection, and enhanced thermal protection. And I really think that this set up what I would call the current era of tank car transportation, which we'll be discussing today. Um, so here we are, it brings us to the, the hazmat transportation era that I'm gonna be covering in this webinar. Um, and once again, this was all sparked by a series of accidents, in this case with toxic inhalant hazard or TIH releases in the early 2000s. Those three accidents were Minot, McDonough, and Graniteville, and it led to research on, with a focus on those class of cars, which are called pressure tank cars, that carry hazardous materials such as chlorine and hydrous ammonia or ethylene oxide. Um, the research response was, was first coordinated under the Next Generation Railroad Tank Car Project, uh, or Next Gen Project uh, in short, and the Advanced Tank Car Collaborative Research Program, or Advanced Tank Car Program, that I'll be discussing today. Um, other things that happened during this period is that separately, while that research was going on, advances in extraction technologies produced a rise in crude oil shipments, resulting in increasing high profile accidents with fires of oil tank cars. Um, and the most severe of that is shown here, the Lac Magantic uh, in Canada being the you know, most severe with, with a number of, uh, a good number of fatalities. Um, this put pressure on improving the DOT 111 tank cars that were used for flammable liquid shipments. Um, and then ultimately regulations were passed to improve both the pressure tank cars and the oil tank cars in 2009 and 2015 rulemaking uh, respectively. Um, and then finally I'm showing on here something that you're probably familiar with is the New Palestine, Ohio derailment earlier this year that has been sig significantly covered in the news. And I think again, we have a high profile accident, um, although at this point the impacts of that on regulation and changes for railroad safety is not yet certain. In parallel with these efforts that I just showed on the previous slide, uh, FRA with support from the Volpe Center was running a uh, supporting full scale tank car impact test program. Uh, these tests were performed at uh, TTC uh, in Pueblo, Colorado, um, and they were providing much needed data for development and val validation of the tank car safety modeling capabilities that were being developed uh, along with it. One of the things that, that's interesting is that all of this hazmat tank car research and regulatory activity that, that was described has been performed during a period or resulted in a period with a trend of declining accidents resulting in releases. The graph shows the number of FRA reportable accidents with a release over the period from 1975 to 2020, and there's a clear trend in declining releases. However, even with this significantly improving hazmat safety trend over the last four years, the high profile accidents will continue to put pressure on the government and railroads to make further safety changes. You know, again, New Palestine. So the first major research program in this area that I'm covering is the Next Generation Railroad Tank Car Project. I uh, will be presenting a brief introduction to the project and then highlights of the major research efforts and findings. The Next Gen Project had a large number of participants from industry and government. Um, I really feel it was a well-organized and run project primarily under the leadership of Dow Chemical with UTLX and UP as their partners. Um, the objective of this program was to initially set to improve the safety and security of these toxic inhalant hazard or TIH tank cars with a high stretch goal of uh, five to 10 times improvement. Um, although they, they set conditions that anything they develop must not introduce any new failure modes or vulnerabilities and it must be capable of meeting government and industry compliance requirements. The Next Gen project quickly initiated a program of full-scale impact tests to assess the current status of puncture resistance and the community capabilities to predict what would happen in, in impact. And here's 
example of that first test. Um, what the test identified uh, was first off that we needed to do a little bit of work to improve our test design to enhance repeatability and reproducibility, make it be something that you know would get good quality data out of and data that would be better for uh, validation of modeling. Um, another thing it identified is that it used a, a 17 by 23 inch impactor and when we start to scale up to when we improve the strength of these tank cars and we want to get up to the point where it ruptures, we're going to have to be hitting it very hard and maybe exceeding the capacity of the test facility and impact wall. So we needed to do something to bring down the, the energies involved with, with the test program. Um, and then in terms of analyses, uh, there were pretest predictions done in this, and overall the agreement was quite good. The graph at the bottom there shows a comparison of the measured and predicted tank force displacement characteristics, and, and overall that's good agreement. Um, so we're, we're starting from a fairly good place. But one of the things identified is that um, our capability to predict under what conditions the tank would be punctured we're not nearly to the point of predicting the overall deformation response. Um, there's a lot less certainty on being able to say what are the conditions at which you transition from an impact to a puncture. So we needed to do work on that. This resulted in the initiation of a significant program of laboratory material and component testing to develop the needed information um, where we could uh, create and validate damage and failure models and implement that into our impact analyses. And this just shows some of the types of tests done and the number of tests being done on materials and components uh, available to understand and design better tank cars. Uh, as an example, characterizing steel material response and failure, the uh, first thing is you do a tensile test that tensile test allows you to create a constitutive model that can predict the uh, stress-strain curve as shown here. Um, this is a comparison of a simulated and the measured data for a tensile test for TC-128B, the standard tank car steel. We then did a whole series of tests including notch ground bars and combinations of tensile and shear um, to get the behavior under different stress conditions which that information that's needed to develop a damage and failure model that accounts for damage development under different stress conditions. And the type of uh, failure model being used was the bowers uh failure model, which um, accounts for the, the stress traxiality and meaning the stress state on damage development. So as you get to higher levels of confinement, the damage develops more quickly. And the key to this is that, you know, we're able to then have the ability to understand under any different loading condition how the tank will deform and then fail. Um, one of the things we do de do, and it's shown here, is our first level validation of these models is by simulating all the tests that were performed. And in each case, we have comparisons of the calculated and measured stress strain curves under all these tests. And what you see is that we're able to reproduce both the shape of each of the tests, but also the failure point. And so that tells us that we have done a good job of capturing the mechanics and damage model or failure model that can be used for tank punctures. The second level of validation was in component testing. And here we're showing a, a panel punch test. Um, and in this case, there's different combinations of punch diameters and hole diameters. And you're looking at three separate tests. Uh, and then the comparison of the simulation to the test, and it shows once again that we can model both the force deflection characteristic, but also the time at which the, the panel will be punched um, and fail, and we get good correlation between the model and the testing. So we feel good about that. We now have a capability we can use to predict failures in our full-scale tank impact tests. So that leads us into uh, test number two in the NextGen program. Um, it was performed successfully with a six by six inch impactor at 15 miles an hour and it punctured the tank. Um, the test planning 
had uh, that we did and made changes in the condition instead of sitting on trucks it's sitting on skids on a on a platform we lowered it down so that the cgs of the ram car and the tank were more aligned and what this all did is is created a much more repeatable and reproducible impact response um, at the bottom you see the comparison of the measured and calculated force deflection characteristics for this test and we do a good job of, of matching both the, the development of impact forces and then the point at which we punch through the test and we have a failure. Um, so what we learned from this is that we've, you know, we validated our full impact and puncture modeling capabilities and we now have a simulation tool that is useful for us to assess and develop improved puncture resistant tank designs. The first thing that was done in the program at that point was to to use our capability to look at basically traditional tank designs. Um, these are a tank and a jacket, uh, and then we'd look at diff tanks of different pressure ratings. So we say 300 pound, 500 pound, 600 pound. That's within the tank car community. That that is how you describe uh, tanks with a 300 psi pressure rating, a 500 psi pressure rating, and 600 psi pressure rating. Uh, and tanks designed for different commodities such as chlorine or ethylene oxide. Um, part of why this is important is they'll have different internal pressure levels and um, outage volumes. And then we could look at different combinations of tank and jacket thickness and, and see what gives us the best protection. One of the things that was identified in this is that the primary failure mechanism was a punch shear failure mechanism. So the impactor is pushing against the tank wall, and when the impact force gets high enough that it exceeds, exceeds the shear strength around the edge of the impactor face, then it punches through and you have a, a puncture. The second thing that was done was then to look at more advanced protection concepts. Um, and the first thing that we did is actually go out and look at other modes of transportation, other research communities, defense, whatever, and say, well, what are the things that might work? So we looked into, you know, CEM, crash energy management, uh, blast energy dissipation, you know, doubled hull tankers, ships, et cetera, and came up with these mechanisms of, you know, blunting the impact, absorbing the energy, reinforcing the commodity tank, controlling the load path. Um, and this led to protection concepts such as like, uh, a layered um, metal st structure and foam systems, um, and those could be attached to the tank or separate from the tank, uh, engineered metal structures um, or composite materials for protection. And here we're showing a couple of those kinds of systems for head protection that were evaluated. One of the problems we kept coming up against is that a common weakness identified for these systems is they would be vulnerable to small impactors. Um, and by small impactors, think of, say, a broken rail, which has been in many derailments seen to come up and, and punch right through a tank car. Uh, something of that size can then defeat these layers sequentially at lower force, lower energies, lower forces, compared to all of them coming together and working uh, in an optimum way. Um, and so the problem we're getting here is that these systems were kind of incompatible with the project goal of not introducing any new failure modes or new vulnerabilities because they might perform really well for large impactors but not well for small impactors. Um, and that, that would be a vulnerability of these systems. So kind of a summary of what was done and what you learned out of the next gen research program. Um, first off, it, it, it really moved our understanding of the problem significantly. It developed uh, a critical significant amount of test data, both on materials and components, but as well as on the full tank structures. Um, and it developed that very important puncture modeling capability that, that supported the assessment of advanced concepts. Um, so we have a much greater understanding of the, of the overall mechanics. Um, we developed what we thought was a, a good test protocol for full scale tanks. The six by six impactor was considered small, 
but still important based on examples such as the broken rail that have been seen in practice. Um, but unfortunately, the NextGen program was not able to develop any new protection concepts that would meet the goals of five to 10 times uh, enhancement in puncture resistance. Um, what we found is that really the traditional designs still perform best of everything that we evaluated. However, we did note that significant improvements could be attained by increasing thicknesses and potentially optimizing the layer combinations. And then, of course, at the towards the end of the next year program uh, in March 2009, the federal regulations on these TIH tank cars were updated, which implemented thicker cars, basically higher pressure rating for each of the commodities. At the conclusion of the next gen program, that led us to the second major research program that I'll present, which is the Advanced Tank Car Program. Um, <clears throat> I'll give, a, again, a brief program introduction and then summarize the major research findings and efforts in that. The Advanced Tank Car Program really was thought of as a follow-on to the next gen project. Um, although the, the sponsorship of that program transitioned from being a few of the industry members to more industry consortiums, as shown here, like the Chlorine Institute, American Chemistry Council, Association of American Railroads, Railway Supply Institute, and Fertilizer Institute, and then working in collaboration with the uh, government organizations. Um, so, but one of the key differences here is now we are working from the basis of having the updated tank car regulations for these TIH tank cars. Um, it changes maybe the viewpoint you're looking at it, what your basis for comparison is, and, and then also maybe a little less pressure because now there's a little more stability within the industry because we, we have, we're working on, on the basis of having rules rather than with rulemaking coming in the near future. The tank car, um, the advanced tank car program, even though you know we're in a different era, it was still quite a large and wide-ranging research program. The approach that it set up was that research projects were organized through a set of white paper topics that were identified, developed, submitted, evaluated, and then the top concepts were funded. And here's a list of the white paper topics that were developed in that program. <clears throat> um, you notice that some numbers are missing here. That's because some of the topics were either compatible and combined into one or uh, basically re repeating each other and a couple were eliminated. Um, what's shown out of this total list, if you look at the projects in orange, those are the ones that were funded and the ones I'll be des describing in the following slides. The first one that I'll talk about is the project TWP-5. Um, which is evaluation of composite protection systems for tank cars. Uh, this is an interesting one. It, it was actually started under the next gen project, um, but never satisfactory completed. And so the advanced tank car program picked it up and, and finalized it. Uh, I actually was one of the proponents of composites as were a lot of other people. Uh, the advantage is that since composites have a lower density, uh, you can have a much thicker protection layer at an equivalent weight. Um, for many commodities, you know, the, the, the weight of the tank is the kind of limiting factor. Um, they also seem to be good candidates for puncture resistance based on past applications and say uh, blast resistance or ballistic penetration protection. So we felt that these systems would have a good chance of working. Um, the way we approach this, again, is we first had to develop and validate a model, and we did that against some uh, punch tests that were available in the open literature, and that's what you're seeing on the left in terms of the, the punch panel configuration, and below that is the comparison of the, again, measured and calculated responses, and the composite damage and failure model we're using did a good job of being able to to protect the force deflection and, and failure points for the composite panels of interest. Uh, we then applied that to look at different concepts for how we could incorporate this on tank cars. Um, and what we found is that they actually didn't perform as well as we would hope. Uh, and, I, and I think the key issue with that is that the composites are still primarily a 
an elastic response up to the point they fail. And even though that stress and strength at failure is quite high, the fact that you know, you're deforming it elastically, you're actually building up those stresses quickly and they fail at fairly low displacement levels. So even though they have that strength, they really don't have good energy dissipation, which is necessary for the tank impact protection. I'm gonna talk next about TWP-14. Um, this is one of the projects that was actually funded by the FRA. Uh, the way the program is structured, they had to fund separate projects themselves, but it was being done in collaboration with the Advanced Tank Car Program. Um, and this had the objective of applying the impact puncture modeling capabilities in the models to evaluate tanks over a much wider range of impact conditions. Um, up to this point, we'd really been, you know, focusing on the full-scale test condition of, you know, a normal impact, a square, primarily square impactor that's either six by six or 12 by 12. Um, and there was some concerns that by focusing so much on just these idealized single impact conditions that we could have misleading conclusions about the performance of different systems. Um, so one of the things that, that I wanna say is this, I, I feel that TWP-14 became a significant study that established an analysis framework that was applied in, in other projects um, and gave us a lot of good insights. So I am gonna be showing a few different slides on this to highlight some of, of what was found. Um, what we're looking at here is previously we had said that it's a, a punch shear mechanism that was identified um, by the testing and analysis in the next gen program. So you'd expect that um, failure is going to happen when you exceed basically the shear strength around the, the perimeter of the impactor. And what we're looking at here is different size and shape impactors from, you know, a small three by three inch square impactor, we have round impactors, we have rectangular impactors, again, still all normal impacts. And when we look at the puncture force, which is shown in the graph here, relative to the ram face perimeter length, it still correlates reasonably well. Not perfect, but, but reasonably well. So it, it does say that punch here is the primary mechanism that we're seeing. But we also developed a, a better way to describe it. Um, we found that what we call the impactor characteristic length was a better way to describe the puncture potential of these idealized impactors. Um, the characteristic length is basically the square root of the area. And if you look, the, the graph on the left is the one we just seen where, where puncture force is correlated to the ram face perimeter length. And the one next to it in the middle is the puncture force then correlated to the characteristic length. And by using this new parameter, what we see is that say round impactors, which have a nice uniform distribution of loads around the perimeter, shift a little bit right. And the say high aspect ratio rectangular impactors it shifts those left and now we get a much better correlation. So it, it seems like that's a good way to describe the puncture potential of, of different impactors. On the right, we're just showing the correlation to energy, which is still a reasonable correlation. And then this helped us when we started to get to the non-ideal impactors. Um, say, for example, our rail impactor, uh, which we know is significant having seen it be an uh, impactor in many tank car punctures. Um, here we're looking at it, but in a normal impact, how do you describe the, the characteristic length of this? Um, well, we could do it a couple of ways. If we actually look at the cross-sectional area um, and calculate the characteristic length from that, it'd be a 3.7 one inch impactor. Another way is to say, well, but maybe the concave sections don't matter. So if we put a rubber band around it and look at the bounding area there, well, that would say it's a 5.7, 5.8 inch impactor. And if you look at on the right, if we basically take its puncture force, which was right around a million pounds, and 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 look, those those two estimates are actually bounding what the, the puncture force would be expected from our correlation. And as a matter of fact, if we take that puncture force and, and look, it's basically corresponds to a five inch impactor or, or you know, similar to a five by five inch square impactor. 
and and this really kind of sets up a way for us to start to look at uh, more complex impactors and just describe their puncture potential in terms of comparing them to a corresponding impactor with a given characteristic length. And we're going to do that here for now the coupler head impactor. Um, now this has a very complex shape. Uh, it's not going to have a uniform contact across it. Um, when we do our initial impact with this coupler head coming in in a normal impact, um, we look at its force and, and it's highlighted in yellow there and we come down and we say, well, it's, it's about an eight and a half inch impactor uh, equivalency. Um, and so that's a way to describe the puncture potential of this. But when we go ahead and, and rotate it, say 15 degrees one way, all of a sudden now it's in a much more aggressive orientation for puncture and we see that a much lower force it corresponds to as small as roughly a five inch impactor. And similarly, if we rotate, rotate it 15 degrees the other way, uh, it's less aggressive and the puncture force ends up being more like a 12 inch impactor. So this has an effective puncture potential um, which can range between those of a five to 12 inch impactor. Um, and that's gonna be common of a lot of complex geometries in the impactors that hit. Same thing with going from normal to oblique impacts. Uh, in this study, what we did is we took the 12 by 12 inch square impactor, in this case, a little bit sharper edge, um, and then we first look at it a normal impact, and then we rotate it uh, at different angles in the yaw direction and in the pitch directions, um, side to side or up and down. Uh, and what we see is that we go from, you know, a, a puncture potential of roughly 12 inches down to, say, on the order of 5 inches. And then we took the one um, which had 45 degrees yaw and then added pitch rotation to it, and it gets as small as a 3-inch impactor. So this 12 by 12 impactor has the puncture potential when it's coming in at oblique or, or rotating angles anywhere from the 12 inch to as low as a three inch impactor. And this starts to understand, you know, help us understand why, you know, effectively smaller impactors are probably more important in the tank impact and puncture environment. Here's another one of the key results from the TWP-14 study. Um, we took the various tank car designs and commodities. Um, so, you know, Think of chlorine being shipped in the legacy 500-pound tank car or in the updated standards of a 600-pound tank car, and same with anhydrous ammonia and ethylene oxide. And then we ran a full suite of analyses on each one of these tank and commodity combinations. Um, this included, as we showed before, a whole bunch of different size and shape impactors, but then also impacts in normal and oblique conditions. Um, so each one of these symbols basically represents a different tank car. Uh, well, each one is a separate analysis. Each color is a different tank and commodity combination. And in each one, what we're doing is we're taking the puncture energy that was calculated for that specific analysis, and then we're normalizing it to the exact same impact condition for the 500-pound chlorine legacy tank car. Um, and then when we run all of those, we can now then say, well, what's the average value of the puncture resistance of that tank relative to the 500-pound chlorine? And what we see is, for example, the highest level was the ethylene oxide being shipped in a 500-pound car, and it's 82% on average higher puncture resistance compared to the 500-pound chlorine car. And so this is a real good way for us to kind of assess the overall puncture resistance of different cars, um, similarly looking at, say, a specific commodity, the effect of the rule. So if you look at chlorine going from a 500-pound car to a 600-pound tank car, increase the puncture resistance of it by 37%. Um, that was very helpful for us to have relative rankings of these designs. TWP-10, now moving on, um, was the objective of it was to identify the mechanical properties of the tank materials 
that lead to an increase in puncture resistance. Um, this would support the selection and development of new tank car steels. Uh, we used a, a similar approach to the TWP-14 and basically took a tank car design and then analyzed it with a whole range of different tank car steel properties. And we see all those properties assessed on the left-hand side there. And we get quite a range of strengths, ductilities, behaviors. Um, on the right is, again, showing the relative ranking for a suite of analyses with those of each of the different material tank cars. Um, and, and we see that, you know, from the TC-128B, the best performing ones were either the very high strength or the one stainless steel with a lower yield, but, you know, a lot of hardening and a lot of ductility. And matter of fact, uh, the stainless steel was, was the highest performing one and it ended up with a 55% increase in the puncture resistance. Um, having done that, again, one of the goals of this was to say, you know, okay, we see which one's best, but why is it best? What are the mechanical properties that lead to improvements in the puncture resistance? Because this will help us to go out and look. Not all of those steels analyzed would necessarily be compatible, whether it's chemical compatibility or weldability or whatever else, um, with tank car applications. And, and so we wanted to understand it to really help us guide and go out and look. And the way we did that is we developed these models of looking at different properties and assessing based on that work that was done, what leads to the best uh, improvement in puncture resistance. And what those comparisons showed is that really key factors were to have a lower yield strength and a higher ultimate strength. And that was the best way to improve the puncture energy. Um, lowering yield strength might be a little counterintuitive, but, but what this is is that you know, since we have a punch shear mechanism, the high ultimate increases the puncture force. Um, so that's well understood. But the lower yield makes the tank more compliant during the deformation process. And what that allows for is larger displacements prior to reaching that puncture force. And with the larger displacements, that means we have more energy absorption. So that's why you want a lower yield, a lot of hardening, and a high ultimate. And again, stainless steel, by far is the best with that, but it's also a much more expensive steel. Another program that was looked at, which really drew on the results of, of both TWP-14 and TWP-10, uh, was looking at sandwich tank car designs. Um, the ob ob objective here is to look at the optimization of moving from a tank and jacket design to more of a tank within a tank, which in this case has been called a sandwich design. Um, this concept also allows for the use of materials in the outer layer with improved puncture resistance, but maybe not approved as materials for tank. So a very high strength steel that maybe isn't um, weldable or chemically compatible uh, could still be used as an outer layer for puncture resistance. Um, the first example on the left is shown for a DOT-112 and hydrous ammonia tank car. Um, and so what we're seeing first is the uh, legacy or original design um, of a 340-pound, or excuse me, um, yeah, the the, the older legacy design. Uh, and then what you're seeing is the blue is moving up to the improved regulations or HM246 design. And, and of course, just increasing the thickness of it buys us a lot in that um, almost a 50% improvement in puncture resistance. But then we also looked at, well, what about if we take that, that steel and shift it around? So instead of being a thick tank with a jacket, we go back to, say, the original thinner tank, but with the extra material removed put into the thickness of the jacket. And so what you're looking at there are is the, the combination in red. And it performs marginally better, but not a lot. And then similarly with moving even more to the jacket, again, marginally better, but not a lot. And then both of those, it's not 
necessarily clear at small or large impactors which would be the better one to choose. Um, so clearly here the update and regulations did much more than what we can get with the sandwich. But again, one of the keys to this is we can look at different materials. So the example on the right, I pulled this time for chlorine, um, we're looking first at the baseline uh, about HM246, chlorine tank car, um, as the reference. Uh, and then what we did is we, we moved some of that out so we go to a, a thinner inner tank and move material into the outer portion uh, and then change the jacket material. So the green line would be with the TC28 tank car steel jacket. And again, that's similar to the, com the comparisons on the left not a lot of improvement, but if instead we go to a high strength HY130 steel, 130 KSI steel, that's the light blue line. It performs really well for the smaller impactors um, and still outperforms for large impactors. And then correspondingly, if we go to a stainless steel outer jacket with much higher thickness, there we can get quite a bit of improvement. So what this shows is that, you know, by using an optimized sandwich design and including higher performance materials, there is really some potential for significant performance gains. TWP-22 looked at developing some advanced head protection concepts, um, such as a double head configuration. Uh, the tank heads have always been an area uh, of interest for protection since the number of impacts they sustain um, per unit area is much higher on the heads than on the shells so it's not as much of a weight penalty to protect them. Um, although this is a interesting concepts, none of these really outperformed the traditional heads and head shields, at least not enough to justify the added manufacturing and or inspection complexity. Uh, you'd need to be able to get and inspect inside this area at some point, which would be difficult. Um, so although interesting, it really didn't yield anything that made sense in practice. And so here's kind of a summary of what we got through in the um, advanced tank car project. It helped continue to develop our understanding of impact protection and develop, again, significantly more new data and support for tank car safety efforts. Um, but similar to the next gen program, really found no new high technology design or material that by itself would carry things forward. We did find that there are steels that can help and that we could use traditional tank car designs with monolithic layers, but optimize them in terms of where that steel is put and adding those high performing steels and get enhanced protection. Um, so here's kind of a, a additional findings that came out of the advanced tank car project. Um, an evaluation of the new specification that came out prior to the initiation of this found that the HM246 rule cars uh, improved the puncture energy of those tanks by from 45 to 100%, which is significant. And separately, uh, the tank car safety project developed empirically derived conditional probabilities of release for those and found that the probability of those tank cars having a release is 51 to 60% lower than the legacy cars. So. You know, we should have, you know, 50 to 60 percent fewer releases by implementing that. Um, again, the only option identified for additional improvements are these optimized sandwich designs, but it would require implementing alternative steels in the jacket or outer tank layer for that enhanced puncture resistance. I want to come back a little bit too to the, the final research program um, that we touched on, which is the RSI AAR tank car safety project. Uh, again, just kind of a quick reintroduction to this program and then discuss a few of the efforts that are coordinating the, with the work that was done in, in the previous two. Um, here are some highlights of the tank car safety project. Again, we already mentioned many of the modern safety features that were an outcome of this research effort, such as head shields, double shelf couplers, bottom fittings protection. Um, it's also responsible for many of the ongoing industry activities supporting tank car safety, such as cell inspections, fire protection safety, et cetera. The key aspects that I want to talk about here 
are um, the accident data collection activities. Uh, as mentioned, this is really a data-driven program from initiation and then using that data to come up with conditional probabilities of release. Uh, if you look at this, um, you know, the, the program is collecting a lot of data. Here's the, the graph on the right shows that, you know, on average they're adding 630 cars per year uh, to their database, uh, coming out of 331 accidents per year on average. Um, so they've developed a, a vast database which allows really robust statistical analysis and develops this conditional probability of re release or CPR. Um, CPR is really a key metric that's used by the railroads and industry to assess the risk of shipping hazmat by rail and, you know, coming out of this large database. Um, and so it is important and, and really needs to be applied best to help the industry. And that was one of the things that was identified under the Advanced Tinkar project is that, you know, all this work that was done in the next gen and advanced tank car project allows us to look at new and novel designs, but there's no way to be able to predict the CPR from that because we're just looking at idealized conditions rather than the real world threat environment that you'd have when you put these cars into service. Um, on the right hand side, you know, the, this Venn diagram, Venn diagram describes the state. On the left hand side was next gen and advanced take car projects on the right hand side is the rsi aar statistical analyses um, they're they're absolutely looking at existing tank car designs and real world distributions but there's no way it can predict a new and novel tank car design or feature and how that would perform when put into service and so we really needed a bridge between these two areas and the way that was done within the advanced tank car project was partially by looking at TWP-14, where we're looking at much wider range of impact conditions, getting closer to the real world distribution. But then TWP-11 was hopefully then going to bridge from the t statistical side over and be able to tell us what that true threat environment is, and then allow us to predict the release probability for new designs. One of the key aspects of this is that it identified we really need a detailed derailment simulation capability to do that. And that leads me to kind of my last topic here, which is just to quickly highlight that derailment modeling capability, which is be built to hopefully be the bridge between the statistical modeling and the empirical and analytical research programs. Um, detailed modeling of derailments, you know, we felt like we had all the tools that we needed to do that. You know, we developed the ability to do detailed impacts of tank cars and had tank car models. Um, there's crash codes like Dyna 3D that are commonly available and used in rail vehicle design. Um, however, there are difficulties with derailments that we're going to require additional development. Um, there are many cars involved in long durations, which make them very big, complex simulations. They're kind of uncontrolled, chaotic interactions with ground, things like that. Um, so there was a fair amount of development that was required to be able to do this. Uh, here we're showing, you know, we developed models for different types of cars, the different equipment uh, that would run a little more efficiently, um, different derailment initiation events. We're showing a buckled rail uh, condition here. And then finally, we had to find ways to optimize the lead cars that are pulling the cars through the derailment point and the trailing cars that are pushing them into the derailment point uh, in ways that would be more efficient so these runs could be performed uh, in a reasonable time frame. And then, of course, once we developed that, one of the keys was validating that capability. And the way we did that was to simulate various derailments where there was a large amount of quantitative data available on the derailment behavior. Um, this first example is for a derailment in Saskatoon. Uh, it's up in Canada. It was a grain train that derailed near a grade crossing. And some dash cameras on cars at the grade crossing actually captured the, the response. So we we're able to do video analysis and get what we call the write down response or how quickly the train behind the derailment is slowing down, um, as well as then there was overhead photography that gave us the distribution. And so you can see on the left the, you know, calculated behavior versus the actual response and 
a lot of similarities where you have that close, tight, side-by-side -side stacking of many of the cars, but some differences towards the leading edge and trailing edge. We can do quantitative comparisons of those distributions shown by you know, these two plots, as well as look at the ride-down response that we get in our simulation um, compared to what was seen in the video analysis. And this is very important because that gives us a feeling that we're getting all the forces acting on us, the braking forces, the blockage effect from the derailed cars in front of it, um, grade everything correctly if we're getting a good ride down response. Here's just another example. Uh, again, we're getting a good distribution of the shapes of this. Um, this was a derailment uh, from 2011 in Tiskelwa, Illinois. Um, it was a mixed consist, so I had grain cars with tank cars behind it. Um, and once again, we're getting good agreement on the overall derailment behaviors we see and our expected ride down response and severity. Um, there's many more cases, but we just kind of want to highlight a couple of these. There were some real key things that we learned out of this. Um, you know, it, it gave us a tool that provided a lot of insight into large scale freight derailments. Um, some of the key factors that I don't think were really well understood prior to doing a lot of this include the braking delay time and the derailment blockage forces effects. Um, the braking delay is the interval between when the first car comes off the rail, but yet the cars are still coupled together and it might pull many cars off the rail before finally there's a separation typically leading to that unstable pileup. Um, but you need that kind of separation before the brake pipe is broken. This is an air brake system and an initiation of emergency braking. And that delay time can be you know, on the order of 10 seconds or more. And so that can significantly increase the derailment severity um, if you don't, you know, and accounting for that is important. Similarly, the blockage force is the effect of this pileup that's in front of those cars and the cars coming in are impacting that. And, and so there's a push back on the cars behind that point of derailment. And that again is significant. It can be on the order of half a million pounds. Uh, obviously it varies with different car lengths and different car weights. Um, but not accounting for that, again, will give you uh, incorrect conclusions on the effects of, say, your braking. And so this can be important, for example, um, the recent evaluations of incorporating electronically controlled pneumatic braking. Um, you get misleading conclusions if you only look at the braking and slowing down effect, but don't account for delay times and blockage effects. Uh, before finalizing, I just wanted to throw up a list of some key reference documents. I'm, I'm not going to read these. It's, uh, this will be documented in the, the notes that you can go back to or the, the webinar documentation. If anyone's interested in, in going into any more of this, these are good places to start. And so in conclusion, um, over the past 20 or more years, I really feel like we've made a lot of progress on improving the safety of hazmat transportation by rail um, and certainly in understanding the safety of tank impacts and puncture protection. Um, all this work has really been uh, collaborative um, and I am really happy to have been a participant in many of it and work with a lot of the other people involved. Uh, this is not exhaustive. You know, I'm sure there's a lot of other things that have been going on that I haven't hit, but uh, uh, it's been a good program and I think it's really made a difference as, as seen in that continuing trend of fewer releases. So with that, I'll turn it back to Sri. Thank you, Steve. That was really a very informative and an amazing presentation. Um, I learned a lot from this presentation. Um, for uh, those participants who are on the webinar, you may now begin submitting your questions in the Q&A pod, and Steve will answer as many questions as uh, possible in the little bit of time that we have uh, remaining. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, let me talk a little bit about our upcoming webinars. You can register for these webinars at uh, www.ara.com uh, backslash webinar. And uh, the, the next webinar is on July 19th, Pave Air, FAA's free pavement management software. 
uh, presented by Timothy Parsons, and then on August 16th, uh, Knowledge Guided Machine Learning for Geotechnical Resilience uh, by Dr. Ahmad al -Hassan. Next slide. Um, let, let's go through some Q&A. Um, we have a question here um, from, let me read this. So, excellent research. Did you find any difference in your research in USA and Canada because of temperature? Uh, no, at, at this point, um, I mean, Canada was, was collaborating on this a lot and Certainly, a lot of the data was um, supported through there. There's been a lot of look at temperature previously in terms of tank car steels, and like the TC-128 is designed to have a very low transition temperature um, and perform well at low temperatures. Uh, I think a lot of these two commodities were, are loaded at fairly low temperatures. Um, so, but at this point, no, we're not. We haven't seen any specific difference from looking at Canada versus U.S. So, Steve, here's another question by Brian. Um, what do you think about the safety of shipping cryogenic hazmat products such as uh, liquid natural gas or liquid hydrogen by rail? Yeah, there's been a, a new tank car specification approved for shipping cryogenic materials. Um, and we actually have an ongoing project with the FRA right now where we're assessing those tank car designs uh, and adding that into the TWP-14 study. Um, I think what we're finding is that they're going to be very safe in terms of puncture resistance. Uh, those have a stainless steel inner tank at cryogenic temperature, and stainless steel at cryogenic temperature has really impressive properties. Um, both stronger than regular stainless steels and more hardening than regular stainless steels. So the puncture resistance looks like it's going to be quite high. So I think they'll be quite safe. Um, Steve, I'm going to ask you one more question because of the timeliness of the topic before we end the webinar. Um, this question is by Muhammad, who says, what types of safety regulation do you think might come out of the recent East Palestine, Ohio derailment? Yeah, that's that's a tricky one. I'm not sure. Um, originally, they looked at a number of different things, and you know, some of them were found to have been looked at before or not practical. I think probably what you're going to start to see is maybe some more constraints and regulation on things like the hot box detectors that detect uh, wheel bearings that are overheating, since that was a primary factor in this derailment. Um, it might be different spacing of those. And then also, I think previously, I believe the railroads were able to pick their own conditions under which trains would be flagged, like what temperature bearings they'd be flagged and pulled over for inspection. And that may now be uh, set as an industry standard. All right, thank you, Steve. Uh, we're, oh, we're basically out of time. So if Steve did not get to answer your question, uh, he has agreed to answer questions for the next 24 hours via email. Uh, feel free to send him an email at skirkpatrick at ara.com. Uh, we just ask that you please make sure your questions are not consulting questions and uh, understand that the sensitivity of the topic may limit his ability uh, to respond. On behalf of ARA, thank you for joining today's webinar. Today's presentation is being recorded and a link will be made available on the ARA Webinar Wednesday website. Uh, early next week. We will also send a PDA certificate to all participants verified by our attendance report as present for the full hour of the webinar. A copy of today's presentation will also be included in that email. Uh, please allow us at least three weeks to receive, to send you the certificates. ARA is a great company to work for and is growing and we're always looking for more great people to join our team. So if you're interested in employment opportunities with ARA's transportation and infrastructure offices, or really at any ARA office, uh, please send a brief resume and contact information to www.joinara at ara.com. Uh, that's a webinar Wednesday, join ARA at ara.com. Uh, thank you again for joining today, and we hope you will join us in a couple of weeks on July 19th for our next webinar Wednesday, uh, which is Tave Air, FAA's free safety management software, and the presenter there is Timothy Parsons. Uh, thank you for joining, and have a great afternoon.